Good afternoon and welcome back. Uh, we're delighted to have you uh, back on the campus. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, this session. My name is Sandeep Dhaya. I'm an associate professor of finance here. And I'm delighted to welcome here from across the pond, uh, Mr. Vaka Samad, who's the CEO of uh, FTSE Russell, as well as director of IT at London Stock Exchange. And we have one of our own, Guy Amadi, who would be moderating. The floor is yours, Guy. Thank you very much. And I thank everybody for being here. It's great to be back. I appreciate it. And it's wonderful to be here with you. So we'll get the ball rolling. Um, early this year, you appointed Group Director, Information Services, London Stock Exchange, and as just mentioned, the CEO of uh, FTSE Russell. Could you tell us a bit about your experiences so far running the show? Uh, sure. Thanks, Guy. And, and thanks uh, for uh, the organizers here for inviting me along to, to chat. It's a great conference. I was here last year. and. Um, Fantastic panels, fantastic sessions, and uh, great faculty and, and students, and obviously easy questions afterwards, right? That's what I was looking forward to. Um, you know, since the, um, since the beginning of the year when I took over for, uh, for running information services and, and CEO of FTSE Russell, um, it's been a fantastic experience because what I've really had to do is get under the, uh, under the hood of the business. Um, I've been at the, um, at the group for about three years now, uh, but uh, even so, you know, having joined a couple of years before that to build the fixed income business, even so, it was uh, still necessary to really get my fingers into the details of all the different aspects of the business. We have indices in FTSE Russell, we do analytics, uh, we do a lot of different data products, data solutions. It's a vast business, and there's a lot to get my hands around. But the most important thing that I've found um, has been really, uh, really enthusing for me, actually, is to get out a lot and talk to the customers uh, and a lot of the other stakeholders, uh, especially some of the regulators, um, to just understand what their perspective is about how our business is working, what we're doing for them, what kind of you know, demands they have, what needs they have from us. Um, and try to translate that then into our business strategy. So that's the kind of work that's been going on. Um, I, asked, uh, I asked my PA, uh, my long-suffering PA, um, a few weeks ago, just to kind of check whether my perception of what I was up to was really in line with reality. I asked her to check, you know, how many, how many customer meetings and you know, client calls have I done since, since January? And she told me it was 297, which I thought was pretty good going. So I kind of felt like, the, the basis of the strategy that we're forming is not just kind of pulled out of my hat. It's you know, based on the feedback that we're getting from our, our customers. Um, and we're really trying to listen to what our customers are telling us. So it's, and I tell my kids, I have three of them, you have two ears and one mouth, so you should listen twice as much <laughs> as you speak. I think that's a good, a good measure for me, at least. So in terms of index providers, a lot's been discussed in index providers. We talk about it on CNBC all the time. What do you feel the role is of index providers? Well, I mean, the role of index providers has evolved uh, quite a lot over the last few years. I, I would say that what we consider to be our role today um, is to be a provider of data and analytics and information for investors around the world to make better investment decisions. Um, you know, the, the use of indices has uh, grown significantly over the last you know, 10 to 15 years. And I think somebody on the earlier panel was saying quite rightly, you know, it depends on what kind of investor you are, what kind of investment strategy you're trying to pursue, uh, where you are in the world even, you know, as to what your uh, use of an index is, uh, is all about. So we have to really try to listen very carefully to what our customers and our end users are using the indices for, and then just try to tune our activity to be very much supporting them in their investment decisions. A lot of people will say they've become ubiquitous, somewhat commoditized. Where do you see the value add? What is the value add, in your opinion? Well, value add is the key, is the key driver for what we're trying to do in terms of building our strategy. I think, um, you know, again, different sections of our user base, of the investor base, around the world have different demands of index providers. You've got active, you've got passive. The rise in passive investing has been tremendous over the last few years. We all know about that story. 
uh, and therefore passive investors are obviously uh, uh, critical users for indices, but active investors too, they need benchmarks. Their, their stakeholders need benchmarks to measure their performance, and so they're also uh, have heavy dependencies on index providers. The value that we need to add is not only just doing you know, the, the operational job excellently and, and efficiently and, and in a cost-effective manner, uh, but also to provide support for their usage of the indices. Because if you're an index user, whether you're active or passive, you need not just the data um, at the top level for how the index is calculated, you don't just need also the, the data that supports the buildup of that index, you know, all the different constituents, all the different pricing, analytical measures that go into that, but you also need research um, around how the indexes are performing, how the markets are performing, um, and very often we get involved with our uh, customers who are investors to help them um, put into effect the, the in the design of the index what their investment strategy is, what their um, investment uh, aims are. So we do a lot of research and development work in listening to what the customers need and try to encapsulate that into the index construction. So that's, that's where the value is. Um, one thing I would say is, you know, in all the discussions I've had with customers, um, you know, what's, what's been really clear to me is that in the industry as a whole, and, and for us as a, as a company, um, I think we need to do a lot more work to deliver more value to our customers. That's certainly one of the themes that I'm hearing from all of the customer conversations that I have. We did a little survey actually recently at <clears throat> to, of, of a, you know, a fairly representative sample of institutional investors. Um, and while about 80% of them said uh, they are really dependent on indices and, they, and that's a really important part of their investment process, 50% of them said that they don't feel like they get enough value. So that's something that we need to really listen to. Um, and I'm trying to make sure that in the way that we develop our strategy and how we run the business going forward, that we're, we're attuned to that sentiment. And I think that's something, you know, when I talk to my peers in the industry, I, I, I think that's something that we all need to be a little bit cognizant of to, to try and deliver more value to our customers. It's interesting. You have obviously partners and you have customers and you spoke about the dialogue you're having, but how do you see those relationships evolving. And the world changes extraordinarily quickly these days, more so than in my 33 years or so in the industry. How do you see those relationships evolving? Well, this is, this is related to how the use of indexes, um, and indeed more broadly, data and analytics has changed over the last you know, 10 to 15 years. The, the investment process that people follow, whether they're institutional investors or otherwise, you know, whether they're on the asset owner side or the asset manager side, um, that investor investment process has become more and more quantitative, therefore more driven by data and analytics. That's, that's a fairly obvious statement, I guess. Everybody sees that in, in the uh, activities that we're, that we're watching in the markets nowadays. Um, but even so, I think that index providers in particular have to continue to evolve in their relationships with their customers. It's not, you know, customers don't just want data feeds um, and you know, uh, access to the data in an in a operationally e efficient way. They, they want all of that, no doubt. But they also need support and help from a research perspective, from a, from a product development perspective, to help them make sense of that data, right? Uh, we're living in an age where I think data and analytics is uh, becoming pervasive, but the, the wealth of data, the wealth of... Uh, information out there really has to be translated into actionable investment strategies or actionable investment decisions. And increasingly, I think the role of the index provider is to support investors in making those decisions. It's interesting, the world we live in, the headline risk is tremendous. You know, we find ourselves talking about things we've never had to speak of in the prior 11 or 12 years. But what's more interesting to me is the fact that volatility in the market actually is sort of at the lower end of the spectrum. So my question is, do you feel that passive investing, for better or for worse, and I'm not saying that I know, has dampened volatility in, in the world we live in now? I think it's hard to tell. I mean, I think passive investors tend to be in their investment positions, in their, in their portfolios for the longer term, no, no doubt. 
Um, I think that the, uh, the need to have a mix of you know, active versus passive investors is still, is still there. There's certainly been a trend, as I said earlier, to, towards passive investing for some of the reasons that I think Sebastian on the previous panel mentioned, right? You know, it's, it's transparency, it's low cost. Those are things which some of the um, biggest investors and, and indeed the smaller investors are, are really driving for. Um, in our business, we have a pretty even mix still between the number of uh, our clients who are passive investors and the number who are active investors. Um, I think that probably evolves and changes over time and moves a bit more towards the passive side. Um, but there'll still be a demand for, for active investing, uh, active investors from the indices. And of course, from all of the risk models, all the analytics, all the data, that feeds the active investor process as well. So uh, I think that that split will still be there for some time. We talk about, again, things we never talked about historically that we talk about a lot now is the fixed income market, the bond market, the biggest market in the world. It's now dominated by the role of central banks. What are you doing in the world of fixed income? Well, we um, have been known in, in FTSE Russell, uh, you know, as we have a long heritage on the equity side. So we have equity indices, we have equity data and analytics. Um, if, the part of the reason I joined the group um, three years ago was to build out our fixed income capabilities. So we have now built that out by acquiring um, the, the old city index family um, and uh, that's a range of fixed income indices that covers all the different bond markets across the world. Um, and also their fixed income analytics platform, which is called the Yield Book. So we, we are very much positioned now as uh, one of the uh, comprehensive index providers in the public markets at any rate for fixed income and for equities. Um, and also as an analytics provider and a data provider that covers equities in fixed income markets. The demand for solutions in the index space is, is a multi-asset you know, picture. Um, we have as much engagement with customers now on fixed income index construction and provision as we do with equities. Um, you know, I, I'm, for, my, for my sins, I'm also chair of the Index Industry Association. Um, when, when, when they asked for volunteers, I was the slowest to step one pace back <laughs> in, in that, on that day. Um, but no, the, the Index Industry Association is um, you know, uh, representative of, the, of various index providers across the globe. And we recently, you know, we do an annual survey of uh, construction of indices, number of indices that index providers are, are putting out and, and fixed income uh, and of course ESG were the, the two categories that are growing the fastest. Um, and in particular, fixed income in, in Europe. So the demand is there for um, indices and, and fixed income just as much as there is in, uh, in the equity space. Um, it's certainly a feature of the way that uh, passive investors are now going. There's, more, uh, there's a trend towards passive. There's also a trend within the passive landscape to also fill out the, the portfolio of indices in fixed income as well. So, that's something that we're very keen on, uh, on pursuing. I'm glad you mentioned ESG. Could you briefly explain it and, and, again, what you folks are doing in that space, in that vertical? So on the first question, no, I can't briefly explain it because <laughs> ESG is just too, it's so broad. On the second question, I can give it a shot. Um, but, you know, um, joking aside, I think the, uh, the, the, all the different trends that are in society that are feeding into investment aims especially in Europe, now increasingly in Asia, and of course here in the US there's a growing focus on, on ESG, and I know the folks here at, uh, at the center are very focused on ESG and doing a lot of great work in the ESG space. That's feeding into you know, the same underlying trends in the investment space, active to passive and the demand for indexes, and therefore the demand for indexes that reflect the ESG, um, the ESG trend as well. Um, we, we are doing what a lot of the other competitors in this space are doing, which is working with customers to help them figure out what the landscape looks like from an ESG perspective. Again, on the earlier panel, uh, there were some very um, uh, well-made comments about the fact that you know, investors are still trying to navigate a landscape that is quite diverse of proprietary models that build up ESG ratings and a lot of Issuers as well, as, as well as investors, are struggling with, you know, having to deal with our proprietary model for disclosure 
uh, for us to calculate ESG ratings and then for somebody else to have a different set of questions in a questionnaire for the investor relations team to answer to come up with ESG ratings on that model. And sometimes they're, you know, they don't end up with, the, they end up with very different answers because we all have a different uh, lens on how to calculate that, those, uh, those scores and ratings. What I think is happening at the moment is, um, uh, interestingly, I think people, certainly the larger investors, having struggled with those um, diverging ratings models, are starting to say, well, look, just give us access to the underlying data. Help us, now that we're building our own capabilities and have more uh, compute power ourselves, help us to make sense of the data itself. But they're working with us to design index solutions that have a sort of uh, ESG factor type of approach. And sometimes, you know, we've worked with some big pension funds, interestingly, in, in Europe, who are taking a uh, factor index approach um, in traditional financial factors like value and growth and so on, but also adding in tilts for different ESG weightings. Um, the lack of uh, uniformity or the lack of standardization on the ESG ratings and ESG model front is, is a problem that I think people are struggling to deal with across the world. Again, issuers, investors, regulators. Um, I think we're at a, a very nascent stage, though, obviously, within the ESG space, and that, that's probably a natural course of events. Um, over time, I, I think that there will emerge some standards that people will converge to. The United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goal seems like a standard that people are starting to key into. We recently worked on a very interesting um, project for a large pension fund in Europe who said, look, let's not use your ESG ratings, let's decompose it to the underlying data, map your ratings to the UN SDGs, and then build us an index which weights those according to your uh, you know, factor combination methodology, and then throw in some financial factors like value. So th this is a really evolving space, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier on. We, we have to do a lot of work to build up our value add as a, as a research partner with our customers to understand what their investment aims are and help them translate that into, uh, into an index uh, solution. You mentioned regulation. The regulatory landscape was pretty stagnant for a long period of time. Now it's dynamic. Can you speak about your thoughts sort of on global regulation and what's happening there? Yeah, I mean, in the index space in particular, uh, of course, um, there are two broad uh, topics to, to touch on. One is um, that the you know, post-financial crisis, there was a lot of focus on, uh, on indices, um, really coming out of the, you know, the, the conflicts of interest that were apparent in some of the benchmarks like LIBOR, but then that's kind of translated into the index space as well. And, you know, IOSCO came out with a bunch of principles for how you should properly govern and maintain indices that people are widely using, so 19 principles dealing with conflict of interest and transparency and so on. And I think that was very good for the industry, actually. Um, you know, very often when regulation is applied, um, uh, companies who are in that space, they push back hard at first, they don't want to be regulated, they think that it's, you know, not doesn't apply to them, but actually over time, they kind of adopt, as, as long as the, the, the regulation is shaped in the right way, that they all come to understand that I think actually it's probably um, good for the industry as a whole because it tends to raise the standards. And then in the EU, um, they kind of based on the IOSCO principles and then moved a bit further and, and cast uh, some regulation into law. Um, and so now you have the EU uh, benchmark re uh, regime and uh, we, as, as a number of others, are, are registered as a benchmark administrator under that regime in the EU. We're regulated by the FCA. So now you have a set of um, uh, legal principles that, are, that encode you know, um, proper operation of indices and benchmarks that are used by investors in, uh, in the EU for all types of different purposes. And they deal with the right kind of things, conflict of interest, you know, getting accurate and and uh, clean data for inputs, um, transparency, proper dissemination, and so on. So we, we think that that's probably good for the industry overall. Um, but actually, a lot of index providers, like 
ourselves and, and others have been operating very high standards of governance anyway, so it's just about tuning to those. And it, it's, a, it's a topic that is critical in that value-add discussion um, that we had earlier on, um, as well as data, as well as research, as well as partnership, the, the governance procedures and processes that you have to apply to running indices are critical. Um, and I think that's a really important part of, of the value add that we offer as index providers. And it comes down to, you know, when you have lots of people following an index uh, or a set of indices, the markets evolve. No set of rules. These are all rules-based, you know, uh, systems. No set of rules is perfect at the outset. And, and as the markets evolve um, on which the, uh, the rules are applied, then you have to update and, and evolve the, the rules, and therefore you have to uh, update and evolve the methodologies that are used to construct the indices. So um, how you do that is important, because if you make changes you know, in a slapdash fashion, then that's going to have an impact on the end users who are, who are either trying to track that passively or trying to outperform the index as an active investor. So, so we, we have to have a very robust set of governance procedures and principles which involve consultation with the broad market, which involve you know, um, discussion with uh, end users and, and customers to understand if we make the following change, how will that impact you? And very often we also have a lot of discussion and dialogue with regulators in different uh, local markets to make sure that the, the, um, the opinions of investors are reflected to them because if they make changes to the market structure, and that then affects the way the indexes are constructed as a knock-on effect in terms of impact for the end investors. So we see our role as trying to put together the, you know, bridge a gap, if you like, between what investors need and what the market authorities are trying to do to evolve their market structure. I know you have a long-standing relationship with Georgetown University. I believe, correctly or not, that we have, we, Georgetown, the most intellectually curious, aware, diverse group of students in the world. And they're going to ask some questions in a minute. But my question to you is, what would your advice be to these young men and women going forward? Well, um, that could cover a lot of different topics Absolutely. that we probably don't want to get into. Um, but from the point of view of uh, career, I mean, I think, I, I think it's, it's a super competitive environment. Now, we, we hire a bunch of graduates every year. and. The competition for places in all sorts of institutions is incredibly fierce. And so obviously, you know, having the, 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 the CV or the resume that, that shows all of the academic achievements that many of these um, students and alums have, have, uh, have had so far is, is, uh, is a baseline. But I think what I, what I see the most when, when we hire graduates and the ones that are the most successful in, in our um, in our company are the ones who, as well as coming to the table with a, a, whole, um, a whole set of excellence on their academic background, are the ones who are willing to learn and listen, to your point earlier on, um, and just have a little bit of humility and uh, patience to really get as much experience as possible before then expecting to advance very far. And actually, that point about humility, I think, applies to us as a company and as a, as a, as a service provider to our customers. Um, I think, you know, coupled with that point about listening to what our customers are telling us and what our stakeholders are telling us, I think that goes hand in hand with perhaps a little bit of uh, humility about our role within the industry. Um, and so I'd, I'd, I'd advise people, actually not just graduates, but also others within our industry to, to think about that a little bit and try to operate with that in mind. Humility is a lost art, but I appreciate those comments. With that, I'm going to open it up to some questions. I think we have microphones uh, on either side. So come on, folks. We have our first question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jenny Bai. I'm an associate professor of finance in Georgetown. You mentioned a fixed income index. We know for equity index like Russell 1000, 2000, size is important factor how you construct the index. 
When you talk about a fixed income index, when you open start a new index, what specific things into your mind? The city that a series alone, they usually buy credit ratings, uh, time to maturity. But uh, I'd like to hear your opinion. When you construct a fixed income, in particular corporate bond index, uh, what are some of the key features in your mind? Thank you. So, thank you. It's a, it's a great question. It, you know, every every index is constructed with some purpose in mind, and the the purpose is to reflect some broad market or some segment of the market, and and then that's used either by an active or a passive investor for research purposes or for linking a product to. So, the key point is to understand at first what are we trying to measure, right? We're building a measurement device. And we have to have a clear understanding up front of what the objective is in building that measurement device. And that then influences which uh, parameters are used to then technically construct the index. You mentioned some of them credit ratings, but it may also include you know, issue size on a bond index. You, know, you might want to say, uh, of course, with, with the compute power that we have today, um, compared to when indices first started to, uh, to, to be used, um, you could argue that, well, to, um, to represent a, a segment of the market, then just, in, sorry, to represent a broad market, you just include all of the different securities that are an issue. And of course, if you wanted the most inclusive set, then, uh, then that's certainly something that you could do. But then a passive investor might say, well, you know, I'm trying to track, an ETF provider, for example, might say, I'm trying to track that index to deliver a, um, a representative set of returns, you know, risk-adjusted returns for my investor, and you know, you've, you've put 20,000 bonds in that index, these you know, 10,000 are actually just noise and don't help in the, in the uh, investment objective. So then you might say, well, let's just make a cutoff point and say, you know, we'll, we'll only include things over a certain size to try and cut out that noise. And then you go through this kind of iterative process to try to construct the rule set for an index, which is then you know, useful for the end investor and for the person who's using it. So it's about you know, understanding the objective and then for doing some research work in conjunction with uh, the end user or end users to understand what's the best way to measure that whole market or slice of the market in a way that's tractable for them to use effic efficiently and effectively. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. My name's Li Yang. Uh, the stock market really is not perfect, and a lot of stockholders, their assets are wiped out just overnight, and there's no way to, to have a good remedies. And so I just wonder for this, and then together with the social issues, they're like England, like France, they are capitalists, but I think people are very unhappy about it. And in America, now they want to have a corporate tax. And I just wonder, in England or in France, are they going to have something better strategies so people can have a better, a better society and better life and better family and better well-being? And I think stock market now is a very st strong burden, so I just wonder if you can help make some resolutions. That's a tough one. That's a tough question. Guy, do you have any views on that? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm not sure it's the role of the index provider to uh, determine policy on either investment policy for an ending, end investor or for, any, or for any government. What we're trying to do is just provide a set of tools um, and uh, some support for end investors to make their investment decisions. And it's for the end investors uh, who are managing people's pensions and, and you know, endowments and so on to determine what's best for their uh, stakeholders in that regard. Thank you. Yes, sir. As, a, as an index provider, what do you think are the key risks and the mitigants to those risks um, in, in the years ahead? You know, whether it be the linkage of fees to passive AUM ever rising, or um, uh, the cost of data, uh, your relationship with exchanges? Uh, are, are, there, are there any risks that you're on the lookout for, and how do you mitigate against, against those risks? I mean, I think those are certainly examples. I mean, on the fees, um, 
question, I think it was, it was talked about in the prior panel as well, that there's pressure on, on fees for our customers uh, and sometimes for our customers' customers. Uh, and we have to be really cognizant of that in the, in the way that we then you know, charge for, for what we provide to our customers. But the key part of that equation is, and this is something I I'm, I'm keep repeating, but it's really become a, a theme given all of my uh, discussions with customers out there, is that we deliver the right amount of value for what our customers are, are charged. And it's, it's true that um, we're running a, obviously we're running a commercial operation like many others, um, and so therefore there has to be a, you know, a commercial benefit for us, but we just need to make sure that we're listening to our customers and delivering the right amount of value for the fee that we're charging them. That said, you know, I mentioned that survey that we did earlier. I mean, one of the things that came out of that survey uh, with a, we, th we think a fairly representative sample of institutional investors is that the proportion of, um, uh, of uh, their costs that we represent is, is fairly low. It's uh, on the order of 1% or something. Um, but, you know, we're not complacent about that. We, have, we still are very focused on making sure that we're delivering value for that, uh, for that 1%. And then in terms of other risks, you know, um, and how we mitigate those, it's a, it's a bit of a cliche to say this now, I think, but, you know, technology is uh, certainly a risk to our business, but also an opportunity for us to try to make sure that we can scale up. But that, you know, we have to keep pace with the development of different technologies that are enabling us to get more scale and to make our, our uh, operations uh, more efficient. You know, I like, I, I like to say that um, there's so much focus these days on fintech companies, but actually index providers and analytics providers are, are possibly the original fintech companies in some ways. They've been around for quite a long period of time, but we are enormously heavy users of technology, and we translate that usage and, and those processes and operations into end products that all the financial markets uh, actors are, are using and, and sometimes very dependent on. Wakas, I want to thank you for your time. This is great. Thank you for being here at Georgetown University. Thanks, everybody in the audience. Thank you. And thanks, thanks for having me back. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot.